Swale CM CIAs, a lot of good day and good morning to everyone. Bringing us together is the song Sacred Salmon Time in the background. I'm your host, Lola Hawk Laura Bucher. I am a river woman from Stalo Nation and from Lake Babine Nation. And welcome to this podcast. Joining me today are Stalo Halkamalem language champions and knowledge keepers, Hotwist John Williams and Teetlamsbath, Eddie Gardner. Today, if you are anywhere in the Fraser Valley and you're driving or hiking or walking or even on the river, perhaps in a canoe, you will notice one of the most spectacular mountain ranges in the valley. And that one mountain has a very important story that we are going to share with you this day. Hotwis, when you're making your way through, uh, through the valley uh, east of Chilliwack and you look up straight ahead, who do you see? What do you see in your, your view? I see Tleetleke. Yeah. Uh-uh. Tleetleke is, um, is told to me as a direct descendant of my family from Chiam. My grandmother always reminds me to, to pay that respect as she is uh, one of my ancestors. So I always, when I look up at her and I always, you know, say a prayer to, you know, and thank her for, you know, taking care of me and taking care of my family, you know, and then to pray that she's going to continue taking care of future generations. And so she is, holds a big place in my heart uh, every time I look up at her every single day and I always say my prayers to her. Mm. Uh-uh. Uh, so beautiful. And you know, when you're uh, looking at the, the, through the different seasons of, uh, of Mount Chiam, you can see the snow in various le- levels and layers. Siami Atiliad, Elizabeth Phillips, reminds me, oh, look at the mountain, how beautiful it is. It's getting its covering when the snow is starting to fill in through the valley to the deepest part and to the highest part. Uh, Tietlam's Path, when you're walking or traveling through the valley, what does Mount Chiam say to you? Mount Chiam, Sleetlike, that's, uh, that's our uh, mother mountain. And uh, Sleetlake is the highest peak in the, in the valley. And so you can see why that she was given, she, she accepted that responsibility to watch over, you know, the, uh, the river, the salmon, and the people. And uh, she holds great and deep, profound respect by, uh, by the Stalo people and, and even other uh, uh, First Nations people who pass through our territory. Every time they uh, they travel up through the valley and they see, you know, Sleetlike, they're reminded of uh, of that story of uh, Sleetlike that we're going to share. But my sister uh, uh, Stalamethet, who is part of uh, the Good Medicine Songs, uh, really, really wrote uh, about uh, the significance of uh, Mount Chiam in her in her doctoral thesis. Uh, at the uh, Simon Fraser University. One of the motivations that uh, she had in, uh, in writing about Mount Chiam was because when she was uh, at his school, she asked uh, the little ones, what does Mount Chiam mean? And their hands were raised, they were all excited, they really, really wanted to, uh, everyone, all the little kids wanted to uh, show that they knew all about uh, Mount Chiam. And, uh, and uh, so when she pointed at one of them to, uh, to, to answer the question, uh, she said, always wild strawberries, always wild strawberries. And uh, the, she, she was so thrilled to see them at such a young age to know about that mountain, to know the significance of what it means to them as, uh, as Stalo at such a young age. She knew that uh, the language Chiam, always wild strawberries, will carry on into the future, and it's a it's a motivational thing for people to 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 know that uh, Halkamalem is alive and well. We're revitalizing the language, and the young ones uh, are embracing it. And so, 
Sleetlake carries great significance because it is such a big mountain, and uh, Dog Mountain is right behind it. And there, there are the three peaks uh, in the mountain that represent uh, the three daughters of Sleetlake. And so we'll tell the story a little more later. Teetlands Bath, that is is such a beautiful introduction to this story. And yes, uh, our your sister and, and, and our good friend, Stalamethet uh, Ethel Gardner, uh, wrote such a beautiful story uh, about, in her doctorate work, but also just throughout her lifetime, reminding us the importance of our oldest stories, our Swoquiam. And uh, Stalamethet uh, passed that torch on to all of us to play our parts in revitalizing our Halkamalam language, our beautiful language. Ethel would always say, our beautiful language. And when she said how beautiful our Halkamalam language is, we wanted to learn more, all of us. We want to learn more about how our language brings forth our identity, lifts us up with our culture, and makes us proud to know who we are as Stalo people. Well, let's move into this beautiful story, uh, Tietlam's Bath. We are all ready to hear this story about this great mountain. Osiem, Yakukwasai. Thank you, Lolohawk. Yes, Thlithlike, uh, Mount Chiam. Thlithlike uh, means from where the waters spring. And Thlithlike, uh, uh, Mount Chiam, is a lady, Slali. And Quilshanuk, uh, Mount Baker, is a man, Suyaka. Quilshanuk came over to look for a wife, Stalus. He finds that Mount Chiam, or Thlithlake, is a nice looking girl, Yamakami. So he takes her over to his country. There they have three sons, Mount Hood, Mount Chasta, and Mount Shuksan. And they have three daughters after that, Iowat, Siawat, and Thlumkia. She said, after she had those three daughters, I had better go home to my people on the Stahl River. And so she comes back and says, I will stand guard for the Stalo, so that no harm comes to my people and no harm comes to the salmon that comes to feed them. And then she takes the three daughters up there. Amy Cooper, an elder who knew the, the, the stories of Shuchwiam, mentioned that the dog, Squame, followed her. And she tried to send the dog back to Quilshanuk, but the dog stayed with her. The dog was transformed into Dog Mountain, Squame Smalt, that is visible just behind Thlithlake, who was transformed into what we uh, now know as Mount Chiam, which means if we uh, pronounce it in Halkamelamkal, it would be Chiam, which means always wild strawberries. So the English translation of Slitlike, of course, as I mentioned, is from where the waters spring. And there's the glaciers up in the mountain. And when the, uh, the sun melts the water, then the water flows down into the uh, Fraser River. The song Slitlike acknowledges uh, the Stalo belief that the Shwili, the life spirit of Thlithlake, is still awake, watching over and caring for the river, Hyathmet Yastalo, caring for the salmon, Hyathmet Yastakwi, caring for the people, Hyathmet Yastil. And so this is a way of life for the Stalo and cultivates a strong connection to the land, the water, the salmon, and the ancestors, Siwalath. If we properly care for the salmon and the river and the people, now, Tlaqais, future generations will benefit. The story shows why Stalo refers to Tlaqais as Mother Mountain, Smolt Thatal. 
This story was shared by Amy Cooper on February the 8th, 1962. And so when we look at uh, the condition of the, the salmon now, Thlithlake reminds us Stalo that we must share this story with other people because many other people have come into this territory and now this is a shared responsibility to take good care of the river, to take good care of the salmon and the people. Thank you so much for that Swoquiam story, Tietlam's uh, Bath, and for reminding us that the elders like Amy Cooper carried uh, have carried us on their shoulders as ancestors, and we're picking up our responsibilities to retell and share and live these stories, our old Swoquiam stories. I'm thinking also of some of our uh, important stories about the mountain goat and uh, the other re relatives of animals and the flyers that uh, make their home on Mount Chiam. Hotwis. Would you mind sharing a little bit more about uh, our mountain goat and the importance of that story? Uh -uh. Our pakulkal, our mountain goat, we hold in high respect as it's also one of our ancestors, you know, to, to Mount Chiam. Our young hunter ended up marrying a mountain goat woman and had a family in which, uh, you know, descendants of, you know, into Chiam. And so that's why we, we hold that mountain goat in high honor because, he, you know, the, the mother was a mountain goat. And then they, they gave us gifts from their wool. And so instead of hunting them as they, or as they were, you know, part of us, we didn't hunt them to, to feast off of them as they were, they were our people. And so what we would do at, at the time, would go picking. All the women and the young children would, you know, go pick all the all the wool out of the bush. At when the, when the shedding season came, the, when the mountain goat were shedding their wool, and so all the women would go and the kids and the girls and they'd pick all that all that wool out of the bushes, and they would fill up their cedar baskets, and so they would do this until the season was done. The shedding season was done. And so they would come down, and after they pick all that wool, they would they would clean it and card it and then spin it and and to start making blankets, which we call shwakwish. And I say when we when we give those shwakwish as a gift, it's a it's a high honor to receive that, as it takes so long to make one shwakwish. So you imagine a a, a big blanket, you know, to cover uh, cover somebody. You know, from from shoulders to toe, and to be able to wrap with it, how big that blanket is, and to be how long it would take to to collect all that wool, and to be able to spin all that wool and to weave it into a beautiful blanket to show in that that show quest. you know. So it would be a high honor to receive one, and so because it would take years to to make one, and so that's you know why we. We honor that mountain and our mountain goat, you know, the Pakalkal, you know, because of the gifts that are given to us to use other than the, the wild strawberries. OCM. OCM, thank you for that. And I'm also reminded of the Squame, the woolly dog, that is also part of our uh, oldest stories. And the woolly dog existed, uh, you know, many, many hundreds of thousands of years back, and it also was uh, uh, protected, and uh, the woolly dog's fur was also uh, used on those beautiful blankets, as well as the fireweed plant. So many of the stories of, our, of the land are informing us today, and this is a beautiful story of reminding us that there are are always wild strawberries ahead of us, high on the mountain. OCM.
On Mount Chiam, there are three peaks, and uh, those three small peaks represent uh, the three daughters of Lithlake. Ayawat and Sayawat are the ones that are, that are the highest, and they can see, like uh, their mother, all what is happening, you know, around them. And there is another, the, the, the third peak is lower on the other side, and uh, there's a waterfalls that falls from that peak down to Anderson Creek. That represents the tears of Thlumkia, uh, because she can't see, like the two other daughters, of what's going on. And so we always acknowledge the three daughters, and when we pray and we give thanks and we give, show our gratitude to Thlithlike, we also do that for the three daughters. We'll see you. spiritual guide for the Good Medicine Songs Project is our elder, Siami Atiliot Elizabeth Phillips. Siami Atiliot has been on this land for decades. She knows the language of Halkamalam. She is our last fluent speaker of Halkamalam. She knows the stories, the oldest stories, our Swoquiam, and the names of the plants, the animals, the swimmers, and the flyers. Now we're going to listen to the audio glossary that will help us learn how to pronounce the Helka Malam words in the song lyrics. First, you'll hear Dr. Siami Atiliot say the Helka Malam word, and then you can echo. Then, listen to Eddie Gardner Say the same word, and you echo again. Oral Glossary, Thlithlake, from where the waters spring. Thlithlake. Thlithlake. From where the waters spring. Shwahwi <laughs> Shwahui Huyatha Always awake Hyashmet Yestalo Hyathmet Yestalo Caring for the river Hyashmet Yestakwi Yathmet Yastakwi Caring for the salmon Yathmet Yemistiyuch Yathmet Yemistiyuch Caring for the people Hey, 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 hey. 
the story of how these good medicine songs came to be is unique. Holly Arnson and Kevin Wright are songwriters, musicians, and producers who specialize in music that educates about ecology. They co-wrote the songs and produced the recordings and events for the Good Medicine songs. Welcome to the podcast, Holly. A swale, Lola Hawk. A swale, Holly. It's so wonderful to be here with you. These songs are lifting us up, and I know you have brought some stories to share about how they came into being. They are lifting us up, that's for sure. Um, the, the idea behind creating these bilingual songs, there's a number of reasons. One is it gives children of Stalo and non-native background a song to sing together, and they sing it for their families who come from all different backgrounds. That simple act helps to build relationships, it helps to build intercultural understanding, and it helps to build reconciliation. Mm. And it also helps to bring people into the ecology of what's going on in the world around us. It's so true. The, the good minds and good hearts that came together to bring these songs forward, and now the generosity of the same good hearts and good minds to give these out to not just Stalo, but everyone uh, and all ages. Exactly. What I find, Lola Hawk, is in singing the songs and learning the Hulkamalum, it strikes a really deep chord in me. It's just something that I want to know and understand. It, it feels really, really good. Mm. When I first heard the story of Hlifleke and that phrase, from where the waters spring, and I thought about it's the connection to the glacier at the top of Mount Chiam, the glacier that feeds the river down below, the river that nurtures the salmon that feed the people. It's a connection to the climate emergency unfolding all over the world and the melting of glaciers. This song has a message that we all need to be thinking about climate and do everything we can to stop global warming and make a transi- transition to renewable energy. I love how the Stalo story brings the mountain alive. She's one of our relatives and is there to care for us. And in return, we need to care for her. Thank you, Holly. The interconnection between traditional Indigenous knowledge and Western science is profound and deep. Here to share more about what all of this means, please welcome scientist Dr. Marvin Rosenau. He teaches fish ecology and management as well as environmental monitoring at British Columbia Institute of Technology. The flow of water in the eastern Fraser Valley is critical to the very existence of life in this geographic area. Central to all this is the Fraser River, which has been part of Stalo culture from time immemorial. The ecosystems, fish and otherwise, within the eastern Fraser Valley are adapted to the various discharges and flow regimes that occur here. Southwestern British Columbia is wet and rainy in any event, and the smaller tributary streams such as the Vedder Chilliwack River, the Chehalis River, Norris Creek, and others are subject to the seasonal variability of the local precipitation. Mostly for this part of British Columbia, the fall and early winter are wet and rainy, thus the river flows can be high and often variable and this is when the biggest floods in these streams often occur. Spring runoff of the snow from the surrounding hills tends to be modest but steady and then in the summer and early fall you can actually have drought-like meteorological conditions. The mountains in the eastern portion, such as Chiam, can get a snowpack in October, but it normally disappears sometime around the mid-spring. These local snow accumulations can significantly affect the surrounding watercourses, particularly during their spring melt. And many species of fishes in Stalo territory are adapted to these rain uh, and snow melt and flow patterns. But the one defining feature of water discharges in the eastern Fraser Valley that really overwhelms every uh, other watershed is the mighty Fraser River. 
It carries through the Fraser Valley the accumulation of rain and snow melt from about a third of the province right past the lands of the Stalo peoples. This watershed is much different than that of the coastal streams as the big flows are generally not in the fall and early winter, but during the spring when the interior snowpack is melting. Thus, historically, peak flows for the Fraser River in the Chilliwack, Agassiz, Hope area are normally around June. Prior to the European settlement and the extensive diking that we now have, the landscape was profoundly inundated and many fishes, plants and animals were part of this extraordinary flood pulse that could sometimes reach into what is now downtown Chilliwack. Much of this wetted area would have been used by juvenile salmon and other species of fishes for rearing. And uh, certainly white sturgeon would spawn in the springtime and would be using this large discharge volume that occurred during this time period. Indeed, uh, the uh, whole landscape was a giant larder for the First Nations communities that lived here from time immemorial. Sumas Lake, uh, which has now been drained again, has been considered by the Sumas First Nations community as their own essentially a giant refrigerator, a giant food larder. So the flood flows have now been straight jacketed due to an extensive, extensive network of dikes and training structures. And so the water does not get across even a, a small portion of its historic landscape. So despite the big flood of 1948, which uh, at Hope was 15,300 cubic meters per second, and the giant, mostly pre-European flood in 1894, which was about 17,000 cubic meters per second, very little of the developed landscape now gets wet. This is because the dikes are so large and they're so effective. So where once fish grew and beaver and waterfowl and willows and cottonwoods and cedar, we now grow corn and grass and subdivision, shopping malls and uh, highways. The flows are still profound enough that the range and discharge can be about 500 cubic meters per second in the winter, which is the lowest period, to over 12,000 cubic meters per second during some of the larger spring freshets. And the range and water height can be often over 5 meters, so there's still huge swings. But again, that vast wetland ecosystem that once flourished here in Stalo territory has almost completely vanished because the Fraser River in this part of the drainage has been profoundly confined due to diking, and those large and vast wetland areas have now been converted to anthropogenic use, such as, again, farm fields and subdivisions and shopping malls and uh, places for people to live and recreate. I asked Holly and her partner, Kevin Wright, to contribute a song that they wrote about watersheds because it is connected to Thletha Quay.
Thank you for listening to this podcast. Your voices now can share the knowledge of Mount Chiang through songs and stories. Thanks also to the University of the Fraser Valley for their generous support of this podcast. And now, dear Siayas, my dear friends, be well, take care of each other, and remember that Thalithakwe is looking out for all of us. Kwetzlama. See you soon. This Good Medicine Songs podcast is hosted by Lola Hawk, Laura Bucher, with spiritual guidance by Siemi Ateliot, Elizabeth Phillips, with Tietlam's Path, Eddie Gardner, Hot West, Johnny Williams, scientist Dr. Marvin Rosenau, and singer-songwriters Holly Arntzen and me, Kevin Wright. We wish to give special thanks to the Squaw First Nation for their support in bringing the Good Medicine Songs to life. The Good Medicine Songs podcast is produced by the Artist Response Team. To find out more about the Good Medicine Songs project, please visit artistresponseteam.com slash goodmedicinesongs. Oh.